Hello and welcome to the Southwark Sea Farmers presents a conversation with Peter Malinowski, the Executive Director of Billion Oyster Project. I'm here today with Peter Malinowski um, and I'm Alexandra Tulti, environmental journalist. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. So um, Billion Oyster Project, I think for many in the marine aquaculture world is synonymous with um, oyster reefs and very big in the marine world right now. Could you share a little bit about how you got into oysters and um, as well as a little background on Billion Oyster Project? Sure. I've actually never been out of oysters. Uh, my parents started the Fishers Island Oyster Farm on Fishers Island, New York, just east of here uh, about 40 years ago. and had five kids at the same time that they were starting the farm. So we all grew up working on the farm. So, I mean, there, there was been, I've been interested and excited about oysters since before I can remember. And Billion Oyster Project is a, we're a nonprofit located on Governor's Island, right in the middle of New York Harbor. And our mission is to restore oyster reefs through public education initiatives. So it's all about restoring the landscape that used to exist in New York Harbor and doing that in a way that's accessible to as many people as, as possible. I love the work that you do, and I have to say one of the things that is really impressive with you guys is that um, how you kind of are able to reach new people and make oysters very inclusive. I think out on the East End, we're lucky enough to be surrounded by the sea, and it's something that, you know, is a part of our lives, but I know in New York City, people, the coastlines have kind of been forgotten as the cities develop. Can you share a little bit about how the um, your organization is bringing citizens closer to their coastlines when they weren't able to before. Yeah, and that's, uh, New York City's really interesting that way. There's over 500 miles of coastline in the city. Most streets in New York end at the water's edge, but as you said, most New Yorkers don't think about the fact they live in a port city or think about living on the water. That connection to the to the harbor, to the water, has been sort of lost over the years, primarily because the harbor was a you know sort of disgusting and polluted place for a really long time. And so what we try to do, we, we build, I mean, we have a bunch of different ways to do that, but just sort of raising awareness about the harbor, raising awareness about the role that oysters can play in making, a, you know, making the harbor better, and then also building small oyster reefs in communities and, provide, and making those accessible so people can walk down from the shore, take out sections of the reef, monitor them, very similar to what you do with your spat cage, with your own oyster cage, and the but we try to make that experience um, as, as easy to access as possible in as much of the city as possible. And we have a similar program to the SPAP program where, where we have oyster research stations, which schools adopt or individuals and they monitor them it's very throughout the year. They're not for consumption. None of our oysters are, you're not allowed to eat any of our oysters, it make you sick. But, the, uh, but it's, it's just another way to get people excited about the animals that live in the harbor. I love that. And I think it's so important, you know, when we talk about how do we protect our marine environments, you know, there's so much science behind all these different things, but if we don't get community buy-in, I don't think we're able to do what we all want to in this world. Right. All, all of our environmental problems are people problems. Yes. And we, it's easy to get lost in the science and, 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 and for, for a lot of folks to think that the science and policy is not their concern or not that, you know, they don't have the access to that information. But if, if you fall in love with something, if you're excited about the nature near your home, then you're more likely to make decisions in your life that can support a healthy natural environment. I love that. And so Billion Oyster Project, the name is obviously very catchy. As a marine food reporter, I can't tell you how many people are like, do you know Billion Oyster Project? Like you guys are definitely have the cachet. How many oysters have you guys planted? I've been trying to find the numbers. and. You know, what is the goal? If you could talk a little bit about that. Well, this is a hard time of year to keep track mm -hmm. because this is when all of our oysters are going in the water. So for, from November till, uh, you know, the middle of June, it's a very easy question, 75 million oysters, but now we're probably, you know, somewhere between 86 and 91 million oysters. So we still have, you know, 910 million to go before we get to a billion. So we're a long way from our goal, but we're trying to, we, we do more every year. And so the goal is, we're, we're, our aim this year is to do 50 million oysters, uh, to introduce 50 million oysters to the harbor, and, um, and we're trying to, yes, we are trying to get to 1 billion oysters. I love that. And so you've compared oysters in the harbor to trees in the forest. 
Can you explain a little bit about that analogy for the average person? Yeah, and that's, I think that's a, a really helpful analogy, and, it, and it's sort of surprising because you don't think of oysters like trees, but they are in, in many ways very similar because they create, you know, the forest doesn't exist without trees, and trees have all these, have a bunch of different ecosystem services they provide. They improve air quality, they provide structure, they provide homes for other animals and other plants, and with, without the trees, you don't have the landscape. And oyster reefs are very similar. They uh, the um, most people uh, get excited about the water filtration ability of oyster reefs, and that's, I, th I think, similar to the the way that trees improve air quality. But the uh, the habitat creation, the three dimensional habitat that oyster reefs create, is the is the ecosystem service that we're most excited about. We're trying to restore the landscape. We want the harbor to be a more diverse and more abundant place. And the biggest thing preventing that now is that almost the entire harbor is a flat and featureless place. And anyone who spends any time fishing knows that you, you, know, you fish where there's structure. And so what we're trying to do is, is rebuild that landscape in the same way as if you were reforest, reforesting a clear-cut area of forest, you would start by planting trees. So we um, had a show a couple months ago, and it's all about oyster reef rehabilitation on around Long Island um, mm -hmm. more. And, you know, one of the things that's interesting in this field is we're essentially, as you're saying, kind of trying to recreate something that did exist, that humans have basically damaged. Um, so could you share a little bit about, you know, in this process of recreating these oyster reefs, what have been some of the failures or surprises that you guys have found upon the way? Oh, um, <laughs> that's, a, that's a big question. There's lots of, I mean, we, everything that we do, everything that we put in the water is a is in some ways a research project. We're trying to answer a question or try to learn more about our installation strategies, what works and what doesn't. And so we're constantly learning. And the, the most interesting learning often happens when things don't work. So we have uh, we have restored a, you know small oyster reefs and come back in a month and they have all been eaten by oyster drills. Like that has happened. We've put some oyster reefs down and come back and they're entire, entirely covered with sediment. And that t tells us that those are probably not the best places to build those reefs. And we have other sites where the oysters do really well, but maybe we see no recruitment of a, you know, wild or feral spat coming back to the site. And then we have other sites where you know, the oysters may do marginally, but we see a lot of recruitment. And so the, you're taking all those different factors into consideration um, and, and trying to learn which areas are the best and which structures. We build almost all of our oyster reefs using reef structures. So rather than putting loose uh, mm. live animals on the bottom. We, because it, it's such a dynamic environment in New York Harbor and there's so much sediment, we're trying to simulate a reef that's had some time to grow. So the typical reef structures for us are about four feet long, about the size of a coffee table that's bigger than this coffee table, like this big. And they weigh about 400 pounds and th th those are our typical reef structures. Um, and, and that design has, you know, there's been a lot of iterations over the years we've kind of settled on, the, on that particular shape. And what is the material? Because that was one of the things that um, we kind of talked about is that it's actually, oysters can be a little bit particular about what they want to attach to. Yeah, they can, they, they can absolutely, but they'll also attach to just about anything. So we've mm -hmm. seen oysters on plastic bags, on tires, on obviously pilings, rocks, all kinds of different things, uh, city bikes that have ended up in the water. Oh, um, really? But the, uh, so they'll, they'll attach, and, and, and the, the the, um, you know, that's a, a factor of the density of the larvae that's in the water. So if there's a ton of den a ton of larvae in the water, you'll see a greater variety of substrate. Mm -hmm. But like you said, oysters prefer setting on shells. And we collect, uh, we, we try to only use shells that we've collected from restaurants. Mm -hmm. So we use, a, um, we partner with the Lobster Place, which is a direct restaurant seafood distributor. <clears throat> and right now we're collecting from about 60 restaurants in Brooklyn and Manhattan and the truck goes around a few days a week, collects all those shells and brings them out to Governor's Island where, where they'll spend a year out of the water because we want to make sure that we're not introducing any organisms or pathogens from other places and because oysters come into New York City from mm -hmm. all over the country and in some cases all over the world, we want to, those, those shells need to spend a year out of the water so it's safe to, before it's safe to put them back in. Oh, is that, I didn't realize that's where the year came from. It's for yeah. like bringing other organisms possibly. It's a biosecurity measure to keep, to keep invasive species and also pathogens, things that make oysters sick or things that make people sick out of the water. And so in terms of, 
you know, it sounds like the the signs behind where you place a reef, like everything's kind of always changing. What do you consider like a success in terms of these reefs? So we look at reef development and reef performance. And reef development is the the survival of the reef. And so that's whether or not the oysters are growing, surviving, whether or not, and whether or not they're reproducing. And then the last thing is looking at recruitment, um, which is a huge deal. And in New York Harbor, there still is not, in most places, there's not enough recruitment for reefs to grow. But that's reef development. Is Are the oysters surviving? Is it growing? What you know? How sustainable is that site? And then reef performance is, we're looking at habitat uplift. So that's the oyster reef's impact on the environment around it. So the uh, presence and diversity of animals that are associated with the reef, uh, any water quality improvements, uh, and changes in sediment patterns, and that's, that's reef performance. So we're looking at those two things and trying to find sites where the oysters are most likely to survive and the reef is most likely to persist, and then also where the, where the reef has the biggest positive impact. And that was actually an early surprise when you asked about surprises, is the immediate and dramatic change in the local biodiversity that we see at all of our reef sites. Wow. Which is, it's incredibly exciting and fast. So we will put a reef down in a place where you can't see, you know, you can't see any animals. There's obviously a lot of stuff going on in the sediment, but if you go underwater, you can't see any animals. And you put a reef down, and then in a matter of weeks, you go back to the same site, and it's just completely covered in living things. You see thousands of snails and blue crabs and, you know, um, all kinds of different stuff in very short order, which is really exciting. Wow, and I feel like, you know, again, as we're talking about people having a positive impact in their environment, like generally our actions, it's hard to have that quick of a positive environmental action. So that must be a great way to kind of recruit for what you guys are doing and prove out your theory. Yeah, it's super exciting. And I think that you, that you ha would have a similar, maybe not quite as fast, but you'd have a similar dramatic change by replacing a lawn with native spe new plant mm. species. I think you'd see that a very fast um, change in the abundance and diversity of animals that your lawn supports. That's interesting. I've heard that as well about um, like out here, one thing that's big is to promote, if you live on like a pond or any kind of wetland area, to have like five feet of native species between mm -hmm. your lawn. I mean, ideally it would all be native, right? right. Um, but people say that as well, that like they put that in and then there's more birds, like very quick is the reaction, yeah. so. Super cool. And so the Billion Oyster Project grew out of the New York Harbor School. Can you share a little bit about how that happened and what's their vision with the project? Yeah, and uh, we, we've been talking so far mostly about oysters and restoration and Billion Oyster, what, the main thing that makes Billion Oyster Project unique is, the e is that we share the goals of education and restoration equally. We mm -hmm. care just as much as engaging, uh, about engaging people in the work of restoring oysters as we do about restoring oysters. And so that grew out of the Harbor School. And uh, so the Harbor School is a small career, in t it's, it's a public high school located on Governor's Island. And in some ways it's a normal public school and in some ways it's a very unique public school because the students are specializing in these marine fields and learning and uh, you know tr training to become future scientists and boat drivers and scuba divers and uh, on these all these other uh, oyster farmers and um, so I, I actually taught aquaculture at Harbor School for five mm -hmm. years and we started that program with the intent to grow oysters for the purpose of restoring them to New York Harbor and when you're growing poisonous oysters, you can't really do much else with them. Mm -hmm. But the uh, the idea was to, for oyster restoration, that was always the purpose of the class. And so students were working on a project that had meaning outside of the classroom. And then as we were doing that, we realized that we didn't just need oyster farmers, but we also needed boat drivers and scuba divers and scientists and engineers. And so we used the oyster restoration as a way to get students from those different programs working together on a big project. Mm. And at first it was the oyster restoration program, and then it was, you know, maybe Billion Oyster Project. Then it sort of, well, then, then it was Billion Oysters NYC. That's mm. what we, that was the original idea, was to pitch it to New York City as this big public-private partnership to restore the largest open space in New York City. Uh, but uh, it turns out oysters are, which is what happened with Million Trees NYC. Mm. Uh, but the uh, oysters are a little harder to understand than trees. 
So we were never able to do that. So then we launched a billion oyster project as an initiative of the nonprofit. They're harder to understand, you mean for the public or just to understand scientifically how they grow and work? I think that I, I would say for the public. I think there there are, there is a you know a hundred years of primary research about oysters and a lot about oyster restoration. So they're pretty well understood, though probably not as well as trees. And you yeah. also can't see them. Most people can't see them, so that makes a big difference. And and trees have a direct measurable impact on property value, and oysters are it's harder to quantify their mm. benefits. How often do people ask you if you, they can eat the oysters in Billion Oyster Project? Every day. <laughs> <laughs> Every single day. Or when can we eat the oysters? Mm. And so it's never. We can have that conversation as soon, the moment we stop pouring raw sewage into New York Harbor. Mm -hmm. Then we can start having that conversation. And that is, it's a big, expensive problem to solve, but it's absolutely simply a matter of public will. As soon as we as New Yorkers decide as a group that we are not okay contaminating the largest open space in New York City, the greatest natural resource in New York City with human waste, then we can make that change and then we can start having that conversation. I would still prefer to get my oysters from really, Island, really clean Long water, Island. Long Island, <laughs> Fisher's Island, which is part of Long Island. But the, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that it's, it's a little, like why would you want, ever want to eat oysters from a place that was just barely safe to eat, you know, or just barely safe to eat them. But, uh, and I actually think that by the time we are able to eat the oysters from New York Harbor, we will hopefully have stopped eating wild animals, but that's a different, mm. uh, we say our oysters are friends, not food. Oh, so, I like that. That's from Finding Nemo. But the, <laughs> <laughs> or that our oysters have a more important job to do than, mm. than to be food. Because you wouldn't ask that question. I understand why everyone asks it about oysters, but you wouldn't ask that question about a, a coral reef restoration. No, it's true. And I know... You know, I, I told you earlier, I'm a part of the SPAT program through mm -hmm. Cornell, and I mean, I do it, definitely the oysters are like a great part of it, and you know, in the winter you can bring them to parties and stuff, and people love that, but really the the interesting part of it is the interaction with this marine ecosystem right. and checking the cages every couple weeks, and you know, I think for a lot of people in the program, like maybe the initial interest is the oyster, but it's really more just a new way to interact with your environment. Yeah, absolutely. Do you think a lot of New Yorkers are surprised that like raw sewage is still being dumped into New York waters? Yes. People, I bet most New Yorkers do not know that. Um, and so one important role of ours is to educate people on that situation. It, what are some of like the responses that you've gotten when you tell people that? Well, some people are horrified. Some people, well, I mean, it's it, it really is a mixed bag because a lot of people still think about the the East River as a polluted place, a toxic mm -hmm. place, where the the reality is that the East River is by EPA standards safe for swimming and fishing mm -hmm. most days of the year, and so that's a sort of it's a complicated message to give because on one hand there's this sort of disgusting water quality problem that is still an issue. But on the other hand, we have made great progress, and if it hasn't rained, which is when the sewage comes into the harbor, then it, you know, the, the harbor is safe to swim in. I swam to work uh, last week from Brooklyn to Governor's Island across the East River. Oh, wow. And do you like use a buoy or something for that? Or <laughs> it's a swim. No, but like, what about the boat? <laughs> no, I use it. Uh, we we had a, it was it was sanctioned. We had a uh, boat follow us. So we oh, so, okay. Yeah, with a radio. Okay. But, uh, but it, and that's just, that's sort of like a publicity stunt to raise awareness about the fact that you can swim in the East River, and the uh, we also participate in the Citizens Water Quality Testing Program, mm -hmm. where we test uh, bacteria levels at seventy five sites, in collaboration with a bunch of other organizations and individuals. And on Thursdays, so that we can know by Friday whether or not it's safe to swim in all these different places. And so the it, it was safe to swim, which is why we swam to work. Fun, I love that. Um, and so do, this kind of partnership of like educational but also environmental, do you think that's the future of aid work similar to what you guys are doing, where it's not just enough anymore to you know, fund projects and try to restore ecosystems, but we also need to get the average citizen on board. A hundred percent. That's the, the restoration, and this is, 
a tagline from Billion Oyster Project. I'm not just making this up right now. But restoration without education is temporary. It's fleeting. Mm. It doesn't, if you want to meaningfully improve the long-term outcomes for the natural environment and for public school students, stop thinking of those are two separate problems. Train students to restore the environment. It makes teaching and learning more interesting and engaging. And it also, uh, there's no way to teach, hand, you know, like handiness unless you're working with your hands. And there's no way to uh, teach mm -hmm. creative problem solving without a complex problem to solve. And there's, um, and if you restore something and no one knows about it, I mean, you can't, we're not going to be able to restore and conserve the entire natural world. Like people have to start behaving differently in order for the for nature to for the planet to survive. And so, if you're not engaging people in the work, then it's not it's not going to work. Yeah, I think that's a really important point, and I feel like that's something that a lot of environmental groups have been realizing in the past decade. And maybe 50, 40 years ago, wasn't being talked about as much. Yeah, and there and there's a couple different ways to do it. You can. You can go into classrooms and explain what you're doing and use that as a learning activity, or you can ask students to help you. And, 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 and that's what Billion Oyster Project's all about. It's like, rather than saying, you know, do your work, sit down, be quiet, try harder, we say, mm. can you please help us solve this challenging problem? We need your help. We, you know, trust you to make good decisions for, the, for restoring oysters to New York Harbor. Let's do that together. And I think that's very motivating to students. The buy-in is. Yeah, and the res being trusted with the responsibility for something important. And what have been some of the best reactions that you've had from students? Oh, there's so, <laughs> there's, I mean, the students, Harbor School students are amazing. We have, we have former Harbor School students on our professional staff at Billion Oyster Project. That's always really exciting. The, uh, my, my favorite is, is when, um, is watching the interaction between a, a Harbor School student and a sort of random adult who's coming in to learn about what Harbor School is working on and watching the change come over the adult's face when they realize that the student they're talking about just knows way more than they do. Oh, That's really? That's really fun for me. Um, but, the, but it's also just watching students uh, just develop ownership over the harbor and going from being you know, pretty green and nervous and like seeing the harbor as this thing uh, they're apart from and then in a couple of years after working on the harbor, just sort of looking out over the harbor like I would look out over, you know, Fisher's Island Sound growing up. Like this is my place, mm. and that's uh, that's super cool. And that's true for our Harbor School students, um, our staff, the volunteers, everyone who gets to know the harbor in that way. You know, if you feel ownership over something, you're more likely to take care of it. That I really believe that as well. Um, is there any? You know, obviously, you guys are very focused on education and are very public facing, I would say, you know, in terms of this world. Do you, is that ever a struggle, you know, because, you know, I think um, a lot of times people don't love to talk to journalists or media, and obviously that's a big part of your mission, um, or supports your mission. Is there ever tension around that? Um, yeah, yes. I mean, the, the, we're, we have a certain way of thinking about the right way to work with, you know, one of the big challenges working in New York City is that, and we have this kind of one intervention, oyster restoration, mm -hmm. which is kind of a, you know, not a common thing to do in New York City. And we're trying to apply that intervention to waterfront areas all over the city. And New York City is such a diverse place um, that meeting communities where they're at and understanding what communities want in their waterfront and what is preventing access because it could be you know a hundred different things and then how we can work together with those communities to both restore um, you know restore that natural environment but also do that in a way that's uh, welcoming and accessible um, that's a re that's really challenging and the and we've learned and gotten better at that over the years and we have partners that we work with who want to do things a different way or have a different type of message. And so sort of landing and refining that specific message is, is always a challenge. And we have, I mean, I think our, I would, I have full confidence in any one of our staff members in talking about the work that we do in a way that makes sense. But we're always thinking about who we're partnering with and whether or not, you know, we have shared values and, and um, how to do that right. Um, I don't know if I answered your question. But. No, I think that is, and I think, with all of this, I am a big believer, and if you're thinking about it, then you're half the battle of doing things the right way is already there, you know? Mm -hmm. 
especially with when it comes to environmental justice and things around that. Um, I feel like some organizations just don't think about their impact on local communities and are just seeing this as like an environmental thing. So, yeah, and, and that's hard. It, that's a hard balance because we do want to get as many oysters in the water as we can, and so fi finding that um, and you know finding the right balance of bringing folks along with us and also meeting communities where they're at is, is always a challenge. Um, can you talk a little bit about the Living Breakwaters project in Totenville? It was called by the New Yorker, the most extensive nature-based infrastructure system in America. Um, I, that sounds, I don't know if that's true, it sounds true, it's very big. <laughs> the, uh, so the Living Breakwaters is a, is a few, is a couple linear miles of breakwater off of the sort of south, southeast shore of Staten Island, an area that was pretty, it was very hard hit by Hurricane Sandy. And the purpose of the Living Breakwaters is to, it's a shoreline armament structure made of rock and a special kind of cement. And it's also designed with the specific animals that live there in mind. So the, the nooks and crannies in the rock, the size of the rock, the shape of the breakwaters, and the, you know, the addition of live oysters to that whole system is designed in a way to make the breakwaters as attractive as they possibly can be to the, the resident species that already live in that place. And so it's a really neat example of, you know, it's, it's sort of a combination of nature based in that it has the oysters involved, but it's also just really thoughtful about the natural environment and how to incorporate that into a shoreline armament structure. New York City has over 500 miles of coastline and most of them are sheep piles, mm. which, are not, which is the, the least interesting to animals, po the least interesting possible shoreline. Yeah, and you know, I read a lot of archival stuff for some of my environmental reporting and the stories of on Long Island or New York or even, you know, there were oysters that went all down the coast, all the way down to Florida and up the Gulf. What are some of the surprising, like historical things that you've learned about New York's coastline um, through your work? I, I think the biggest thing is just the, the scale of the abundance that used to exist in New York mm -hmm. Harbor, in New York City, in this area. Um, you know, the early explorers describe not being able to see the surface of the water because there's so many fish and not being able to see the sky for minutes at a time because there's so many birds and coming to New York Harbor and saying we'll never need to go anywhere else for fish. There's more fish here than anyone could possibly eat. Um, <coughs> excuse me, but that, you know, like it, it's obviously tragic, but the, you know, there's no one alive and no, who's ever seen nature in, in, on that level of abundance. It's, it's, it doesn't exist anywhere on earth anymore because we've destroyed it. <coughs> so I think that is a startling, like first time learning that was pretty surprising. Yeah, I know um, the, <coughs> sorry. Oh, no worries. Um, the <coughs> Shinnecock tribe here, I've heard stories from their elders that in, it used to be when there were storms that scallops would just wash up on the beach and you could just walk along and just grab the scallops. And then they, I found out though, the last time that happened was like before I was born. I just remember, I was like, that's really sad that we don't get to experience that. Yeah, in, in indigenous people on Fisher's Island used to catch deer, k kill deer by canoeing out, and there were so many deer swimming back and forth between Fisher's Island and what is now Connecticut, mm -hmm. that was like a, a reliable way to catch deer. Oh, they would just <laughs> catch them in the water? They'd shoot them with arrows as they were swimming across. Oh my gosh, wow. Yeah, that really makes you sad. Are there any... Geo, like geographical features of New York's harbor or waterways that you think most people wouldn't know about? Well, there's a lot of cool nooks and crannies, and mm -hmm. there's a, a very many, I mean, there's, so I think, um, I, well, I think one that if, if everyone in New York City knew New York Harbor, like I know New York Harbor, we would stop pouring raw sewage into it tomorrow. <laughs> And that's part of the problem is that the people just don't know about it. And there, you know, there are times when there, you can reliably see hundreds of northern gannets chasing bait fish up onto Coney Island Shoal all winter long. And there's, you know, in Newtown Creek, which is one of the most polluted waterways in the world, I, I can count every time I go in there, I can see kingfishers, northern skimmers, all kinds of wading birds. There's you have several trees filled with night heron nests. The northern tip of Manhattan, right across the Bronx River, there's a dozen nesting pairs of great blue herons. 
wow. between um, Staten Island and New Jersey in the Arthur Kill. There's from one spot you can see ten osprey nests. Um, there's a bald eagle that that shows up on Governor's Island every once in a while. There's dolphins in the East River now. The uh, I once saw a six foot long sturgeon jump out of the water right in front of the boat I was driving. Like there's so much still there, and it's the it's a system that because it's an estuary because it has all the nutrients come down the Hudson River. It's capable of that type of abundance. It has the ingredients for that type of abundance. So it's uh, and you can all the animals are still there. They're just in dramatically reduced numbers. Mm. I think they say like New York Harbor is one of it's like the best harbor in the world, and that's kind of like we it all. It sounds like something we say. It oh, sounds like know. something New Yorkers <laughs> would say for sure. But I think I read it in other accounts as well. Um, just in terms of like the Hudson River and the flow and everything and that I've read that that has a lot more to do with New York City becoming New York City than what I think you know being a cultural capital or anything like that yeah I think there's I mean I definitely say that too like it was the abundance of animal protein that made New York City the city it is I think there's a couple couple different contributing <laughs> factors but I think that was a big deal at a time when, it, when food security was a huge issue and you didn't know whether or not where you'd find your next meal living somewhere where there was just tons of food everywhere it seems like valid and um so can you share a little bit about governor's island and buttermilk channel i know like there's a specific area and it was dredged and it's really affected the so i will um i think everything i'm about to say is true okay (laughs) so buttermilk channel is called buttermilk channel because farmers used to walk their cows from brooklyn um across buttermilk channels to to governor's island to graze wow and it wasn't dredged mm-hmm. what happened was so it used to be shallow enough at low tide that you could walk across it what happened is that as we hardened all the shorelines in the east river the because the buttermilk channel is sort of like an extension of the east river because it's it, governor's island's right off lower manhattan it just goes right by and the water started moving faster and faster and it just carved mm-hmm. out um, both the East River and Buttermilk Channel so that the, you don't need to dredge either. I mean, most of the East River is just carved right down to bedrock because there's so much water moving all the time. I mean, there's three knots of current 20 hours a day. Wow. So it's just constantly moving. And then in terms of building oyster reefs, can you talk about how that's a method of climate resiliency and if you're seeing um, support from that world in that con that way I think <clears throat> so there's the we talked about Li- living breakwaters project and that's an example of using oysters and nature-based infrastructure as like a protection measure from the impacts of climate change um, and that's and oyster reefs in New York Harbor used to play that role in a big way you can look at the sediment record in Staten Island and you can see every major storm event because they the storms push sediment from that's underwater up onto the land so you can look at that sediment mm-hmm. record and see every major storm event and that record stops you know 400 400 years ago when there were oyster reefs there and you can no longer see that signal and so what that very clearly shows is that with the oyster reefs when we had a very abundant oyster population that it was protecting the land from the storm waves mm-hmm. that takes a, a a very large scale of oyster restoration in some strategic places where it can make that difference so, so the, the, the answer is that yes, oyster reefs can play a meaningful role in protecting the land from shores. They're not going to keep the water out of New York City. There's many places in New York City where, like the lower tip of Manhattan, where oyster reefs are not an appropriate intervention there. It's too, it's too deep. You know, so that's, so the, the oysters can be part of the solution, but they're not going to keep the water out of New York City. I think that our oysters play a much more meaningful role in proactive planning for climate change through the <clears throat> community engagement and education components of our work. By connecting New Yorkers to the water, by teaching a whole generation about tides, currents, storms, factors that affect oysters growth and survival, you're, you, by, having, by supporting the whole community in forming a connection to the natural resource, I think that that is a, a, a more important as far as planning for uh, for climate change, than the physical protection, because of the difficulty of what you're saying that you know some places that are more at risk of storm surge and flooding are not necessarily also a good place to put an oyster reef. 
Yeah, that's that's part of it. It's not. I, I think that that I would describe the, and the water quality example is a easier one to understand, but it's the same kind of idea. Like it's a downstream solution. So you're you're mm -hmm. you're mitigating a problem that's you know that's already going to happen, but it's not a solution because like in order to solve the challenge, like prevent climate change from getting any worse, we all have to behave differently. And so the, the only way that everyone's going to behave differently is if more people care more about finding solutions, more people care more about the natural environment, more people care more about their own impact on the planet. And that is, I think that, that is the most important, like our, our most important role in create, you know, maintaining a livable planet is by convincing as many people as possible to care about it. And that it is livable. Yeah. Or, and that you can swim in the East River. Right, and that you know, I think I think that billion oyster. I think that that is something that billion oyster project is. You know, I think that <clears throat> we're able to do uh, play an effective role in raising awareness and getting people excited about nature because of the be, because of our commitment to engage people in the work of restoring oysters. Because we have teenagers scuba diving to monitor our oyster reefs, like that, like that is. That that um, that's a really fascinating <clears throat> and exciting story. In terms of the teenagers, or just that there's like a whole generation that's getting involved. Well, the whole thing that, and and this I don't know how well this is translate, but the we get asked a lot to, um, you know, share our secrets about like our PR secrets, mm. like how are we so good at getting the word out. And the reality is we have a, an incredible communications team, but th they can't keep up with the interest that people have in learning about and sharing our story. And the mm -hmm. story they want to learn, the, 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 the story that people are interested in is the story of the work, is, is students, the general public volunteers, our professional staff working to restore nature in you know, the, the most urbanized estuary in the world. Like that is what is compelling. It's not that we're really good at convincing you know the New York Times to talk about us we we don't have anyone on our team who does public relations it's really just a, we have a communications wow. team that responds mm -hmm. to those requests but we don't do any outreach and the, um, it's because you just it's, made a lot of communications people for um, other organizations very sad because I feel like you guys are like the pinnacle of press with well the I mean it, it, the you know I can't overstate the importance of trusting young people with the future of the natural environment because that is what's compelling and there's so many situations where you have other organizations doing you know having a, a much larger impact on the natural environment than we have but the, the there may not be as much interest in what they're doing and the it's like you said like we were talking about earlier like restoring nature in a vacuum is is not going to solve the problem and so it's more, it's more important and more compelling and more interesting to find ways to engage a lot of people in the, in the work. And do you think that's been a part of the mission from the beginning because it was born out of the Harbor School, so you're automatically kind of in that more educational mindset? Yeah, I think that <clears throat> Harbor School, the founder of Harbor School, Murray Fisher, is also the co-founder of Billion Oyster Project. He grew up on a, on a beef farm in Virginia uh, I grew up on an oyster farm in Fisher's Island, and I think that the and he had an amazing experience working for the Riverkeeper organization and then Waterkeeper Alliance, and was really moved by the by a few different things. One that he spent a year or two traveling around the world and helping waterkeepers start so individuals who wanted to care for a river or a bay, and he was really struck by how powerful a learning experience it was to take responsibility for an ecosystem like that and also by the overwhelming majority of white men who were doing that work and a lot of old white men and that and so he sees these two things and he's working in the Hudson River and adjacent to New York City and also seeing that there's this this disconnect between public schools in New York City and all these well-paying careers that exist in the maritime industry and so that's like a, a broken system so mm -hmm. he created Harbor School to solve for that to, to say that that it, how do you create a, a public high school that not only prepares public school students in New York City for careers on the water but also just um, uh, you know asks for their help in a way and asks for you know 
public school students to join in this effort as a, as a way to, because you know, if we're going to solve these challenging environmental problems, we need everybody's help. You can't rely, you need a diversity of perspectives, a diversity of backgrounds and opinions and expertise. And then, um, so that's, that's, that was like uh, important to the founding of Harbor School. And then Billy and Oyster Project grew out of that idea with like the farmer mentality. Like the best way to learn by doing is by farming. That's I think, and that's what Murray thinks because we're both, that's our background. But the, so how do you take those two things and, and then also while you're doing it, make the Harbor School's biggest classroom better? Mm. It's kind of confusing. A bunch of different no, things. No, I like that. <laughs> I think it all kind of makes sense together. And um, can you share a little bit about a community that has an oyster reef nearby and maybe like how that has worked for them or? Yeah, the, um, there's a lot of interesting examples. The, um, so I, one, one, my favorite oyster reef site that we have, the place, is in Bush Terminals Park, which is in the Sunset Park neighborhood of Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And it's this interesting situation where you have, the park was designed with these two tidal lagoons in, in the structure of the park. So these two big basins that are cut off at low tide and they sort of flush with water at high tide. And there's always water in them, but the, it's a really cool protected place um, that's you know, more than 10 feet deep. So it's interesting to scuba dive in and um, it's always calm and it acts sort of like a settling tank. So the waters, you have better visibility in the water and sunset, the sunset park, the, the community is separated from Bush Terminals Park by these three industrial blocks and the Brooklyn Queens Expressway. And then you have this community that's separate. And so the, we put oyster reefs in, the, in, the, um, in those lagoons because it was a good place to grow oysters, but also because they can, you, th those reefs create a reason to go to the park. And so we mm -hmm. can partner with local schools and bring the schools down. And that we do, there's a couple NGO um, nonprofits that we work with in Sunset Park that bring their students down. And so that the, the reef becomes kind of a hub of different reasons to go down to this open space, get down to the water's edge and interact with the animals there. That sounds so pretty. Do you know a lot of secret beaches in New York then? Or oh, secret like water spots? Um, yeah, I mean, there, there's um, the deaf people who know a lot more than I do, um, especially about like the details of specific places. But mm. I've spent a lot of time on the on the harbor. And you know, obviously, you guys are very focused in an urban area. But you know, there's oyster projects all over the country. I know there's like a lot in Chesapeake, similar to the Spat one that um, Cornell does, or the East Hampton Shellfish Gardening Program. How do you see the work that Billion Oyster Project does working with those kind of aquaculture citizen focused projects? Well, I think the, um, I think we have, so with aquaculture specifically, <clears throat> I think our, our role, um, I, don't, I don't want to speak for oyster farmers, but I think that we do a good job in raising awareness about oysters as a restorative type of farming because that's mm -hmm. what we're doing. So we're just screaming about how good oysters are for the environment all the time. And I think that, that that oyster farmers appreciate our ability to raise awareness about the fact that the farming that they do is the most sustainable form of protein production on the planet. And, um, and we rely on a lot of farmers who come and volunteer at our big fundraiser every year. So we're very grateful to that. And I think that's a way to bring the, the oyster aquaculture community together with restaurants. Um, and then for the other, you know, we haven't answered this question fully. What's Billion Oyster Project's role outside of New York City with other oyster restoration um, projects and organizations and communities? Um, but I think that the, as a first step, what, what we can, what we should be doing, what we want to be doing is sharing what, what and how, how we do the work that we do, what's worked well for us, what hasn't worked, um, and, and just try to, you know, just be as open as possible about sharing information and inspiration with anyone who wants to do similar work. I think that's really important. And so, you know, we've talked a bit about oyster reefs and the ecosystem 
restorations. What have been some of the creatures that you found that were surprising that came back or came back really quickly? Well, everyone loves the seahorses. Yeah, that's, that's true. Everyone loves a, real, a seahorse. Real crowd pleaser. <laughs> um, but that that's exciting. Um, the you know uh, I get I get really excited about the birds because you can see them when you're not in the water. Um, but the um, I mean, you see every everything. You see those little skeleton shrimp, amphipods, uh, polychaete worms, anemones, different kinds of tunicates, um, clams, mussels, scallops. Um, so all all of those invertebrates we, we see at a lot of our sites. And then I, I think the, the the sort of surprising thing is that is how sites evolve over time. So we put an oyster nursery in this particularly polluted area of New York of New York Harbor called the Barge Basin to see if they would survive. And the first year they they did, but they sort of looked terrible and the, the cages were all covered with one species of tunicate, those sea grapes. Mm. And, oh, I've had those before. Yeah. And they're blocking all the water flow to the cages and the oysters are kind of suffocating and they're like, they look bad and it's like, well, this isn't really working. And uh, we came back, so we left the nursery in place over the winter and then like in the middle of the summer the next year, we lifted a bunch of the cages up and instead of tunicates, the the cage material was just covered with polychaete worms, those little feather mm. duster worms, completely covered. And the oysters were growing like crazy, and there was a blackfish and a blue crab in like most of the oyster trays. And it was just this really cool like succession, like just just watching the environment change before your eyes. Because you go from being this sort of like one species dominating everything and then coming back in a year, and it's just this really cool uh, ecosystem in that same spot. Have there been more surprising successes than failures with this work? Um, yes. No, no, exactly. <laughs> that's not the no I think, truth. no, I mean, I, yes, I mean, most, m most of our, um, most of the oysters survive, most of our sites we would say are, the majority of our sites we would say are successful. The surprising defeats or surprising lack of success does not happen that often, mm -hmm. but it sometimes happens in very dramatic fashions. But the uh, you mean it'll just everything like, every, like that's happened a couple times where like the reef has disappeared or the really? just is buried it? under sediment. Oh. That happened in one site, and then the other the other good example is when they were all within a month, all the oysters were eaten by oyster drills, mm -hmm. little snails, and the but that doesn't happen that often. Usually, it's uh, oh the other really. Um, exciting success is that there's there's a whole site up by the Tappan Zee Bridge now the Mario Cuomo Bridge, yeah. which is pretty far north from the city, mm -hmm. um, and there are still so many wild oysters up there that we don't actually see live oysters. We just put structure down, and those get covered with wild oysters, and so that's super exciting. That's the that's the only site where we can build a reef without live oysters. Wow, that's amazing. Because and you were saying earlier that you need like a certain density of oysters for them to be able to propagate in the wild. And New York is just, yeah. Harbor is not there yet. Yeah, so there's, and there's three factors that affect that. There's the de density of reproducing, the density of larvae in the system, are there enough larvae? Is the water quality good enough? And is there enough substrate? And so the, like most of the harbor, there's not enough substrate, mm -hmm. but you can tell by looking at the shoreline. If the shoreline isn't covered with oysters, then it doesn't matter how much substrate you have because there's not enough oysters in the system. And like nearby. Nearby, yeah. Because the, you know, the, 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 the abundance of oysters on the shoreline is a reflection of the density of larvae in, the, in that area. And, the, um, mm -hmm. and so for most places in the city, you see oysters here, oysters there. You know, they're, they're around everywhere, but they're not um, in like in a high density. So you need you need a you know at least a hundred oysters per square meter to land on a piece of waterfront for that site to have a chance of you know the oyster population continuing to increase over time. Um, and there are a few places where you see that in the a few places in the Bronx River and the Hudson River and the, and um, sorry in the Harlem River and the Hudson River we've seen that in Coney Island Creek um, and then. Um, in sort of Western Long Island Sound at some sites in some years, but it's not the <clears throat> it's not consistent enough. We we still believe that we need to increase the number of animals, number of oysters in the harbor in order to get to the point where we see that more often. Got it. 
And um, if you could share a little bit about how people at home, if they're interested and want to be involved, what they could do. Yeah, so um, we are pretty place-based, <clears throat> so we're always looking for volunteers out on Governor's Island. So you can, if, if you're in the city or planning to be in the city, you can sign up on our website and come out and volunteer. If you volunteer a couple times, you can become a, an ambassador and then have more responsibility and more autonomy in your volunteer activities. And we um, you know, come, couldn't do our work without volunteers and without ambassadors. The, um, um, <clears throat> There's a lot of ways for schools to be involved. We have a whole education team that develops curricula and does teacher trainings for schools so you can have an oyster research station at your school and learn about um, New York Harbor and oyster reefs and the, 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 the things that affect the growth and survival of reefs in a normal classroom. You become a member of Billion Oyster Project. We, of course, appreciate um, that's a make a financial contribution. You get vouchers to get free oysters at restaurants and okay. early access to our events and volunteer days. Um, and then the biggest thing is to tell your friends that there are teenagers working hard every day to restore this, you know, beautiful, important open space in New York City. I love that. Well, thank you. And I will open up for some audience questions quickly. When, uh, when, when you set the reefs, do you use spat on shells solely or are there any adults mixed in? We. Our standard process is to use spat on shell or spat on structure because we have sometimes we'll use reef balls or something like that. Um, and sometimes we'll use loose spat on shell, but we have through a partnership with Pew Charitable Trust, the Nature Conservancy and farmers um, and many farmers out here uh, through the SOAR program, we have taken oysters that were unable to get to market because of the pandemic and integrated those oysters into some of our sites also. <clears throat> but most of the oysters, the vast majority of the oysters we use are very small when they go in the water. And when you first started to get the Billion Oyster Project off, off the floor, what was the biggest, what were the, some of the hurdles you encountered? I mean, th we still deal with this. Um, I mean, th one of the hardest things about Billion Oyster Project is the red tape. So there are you know, half a dozen city, state, and federal agencies that regulate our ability to put oysters in the water. The mm -hmm. New York City Department of Education is the largest, it's, you know, just this enormous bureaucracy. And so there's a lot of challenges to, it's hard for a teacher to take a field trip. It's hard for teachers to, you know, know how to manage their, their class in the field because it's not something they do often. Um, it's hard to get coverage for that teacher <coughs> so they can leave the building for the day. So the red tape is a big deal. <clears throat> and for us, uh, <coughs> excuse me, getting the, um, the, the Department of Education to sign on to some of our early work was a huge deal. And that allowed us to get our first National Science Foundation grant that really launched Billion Oyster Project. The South Folk Sea Farmers are in the process of trying to um, put some reefs in Akabana Harbor, which is a small harbor out here. But the paperwork uh, with the government, with all those agencies you were talking about, it's been two years. And we still are waiting approval. I mean, we plan, we typically plan for a two year design and permitting phase for all of our sites, which is an enormous expense uh, for our nonprofit. And it's, uh, um, you know, it, it, it's, so I, I'd say that, that our experience is similar, and, and it's something that we have to plan for. We've gotten very good at applying for permission, and, the, um, and, it's, and we've sort of moved the conversation with regulators so it's, it's less surprising and more, um, we we're more likely to get permission for what we ask for, but it's a huge uh, burden on the, on the nonprofit or the, the, the do good or whoever, whoever's trying to do, put oysters in the water. The fact that you have to permit an oyster reef the same way you would permit, you know, a, a, a mall that you're building is, it's, it's pretty frustrating. Right. I always found it interesting that the worst thing that could happen is it's unsuccessful and you have a pile of shells on the bottom of the bay, yeah. um, which is not a terrible thing. But, but that, a, the paperwork a, is quite incredible. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, there's a million rules to keep bad things out of the water, and there's no rules to make it easy to put good things back into the water. Well said. Very true. Any, do we have time? 
I, I'm interested in the relationship that you have with restaurateurs to, to uh, acquire the shell and, and uh, I guess age the shell. It, is it, um, do they, is the relationship one that is based on them uh, being philanthropic toward you or is there a benefit to the restaurateurs? How does that work? So we're working on a tax credit bill that's been, I don't know where in Albany it is now, but the, but that, that, would, that would benefit restaurants. They would get a tax credit for the, a certain amount of shell diverted from the waste stream. Uh, but right now there's no, they, they don't <clears throat> pay us to take the shell and we don't pay them for the shell. Mm -hmm. So they donate, they do the extra work of separating the shell and dealing with you know, us and the lobster place, we take the full containers and give them empty containers. And so that's an added burden on the restaurants. Uh, but I think the restaurants like, um, you know, m more and more restaurants every year are concerned with sourcing and sustainability and lowering their, you know, environmental footprint. And this is a way that they can do that. And so we have restaurants that, you know, have us on their website and put our logo on their menu and are excited to participate in the program because it helps them do that. And I guess because you're on Governor's Island, you have plenty of space to have that shell that doesn't disturb the neighbors. And <laughs> it, well, so it, <laughs> so our shell, actually, I didn't tell the whole story. It goes first to a depot in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, where it's poured into roll-off containers, big 30, 30 or 40 yard roll-off containers. And then once a month, those containers come out to Governor's Island and are poured out. There's. You'd be surprised how low it smells. If you're really close to the pile, it smells kind of bad. But if you're not, if you're not right next to it, it's not a big deal. We have, you know, ha a, a pile that's like half a million pounds of shell on the island. It's not that stinky. I know when we were talking about oyster reefs on the show earlier, there used to be a program for the restaurants that would work with. I think Cornell and Stony Brook out here, but infrastructure-wise, it was just difficult for them to have a truck that went around enough and is that also a difficulty? Yeah, it's a <clears throat> it's a huge logistical challenge. We used to do it ourselves. Mm. It actually started at one restaurant, Oceana, and I collected shell on a bicycle with a bike trailer for <laughs> two years every Wednesday at Oceana. And then we had a van that that we drove around as not you know, nonprofit staff drove around and collected from about ten restaurants. And it's a huge, <clears throat> the logistics are really complicated driving around the city, you get a ton of parking tickets, it's very expensive. And so after trying it ourselves and partnering with another nonprofit for a while and running one truck, we moved to working with the Lobster Place. The Lobster Place, are, that's their business, is driving trucks around New York City and delivering seafood. So they're very good at dealing with all those things and they run a dedicated truck for the shell collection. But it fits into their fleet and their plans. Um, it's very expensive. The only reason we're able to do it is because that program is supported by Talisker Single Malt Scotch. So the, uh, they support our shell collection program, and that's the, uh, our shell costs fifty cents a pound to get wow. to, by the time it's ready to be used, which is very expensive. <laughs> but that's and that's all the you know mostly the, the carting costs. Mm, wow. Time for one quick question. I have a question. The, uh, how often do you monitor your reefs and what is the protocol in monitoring them? Great question. Um, the, the, we, we aim to, to monitor every insulation twice each year in the spring and in the fall. And the protocols are um, to look at the oyster growth and survival. You know, we're, it, de it depends really on the type of installation. We're essentially taking a random section of the reef and looking at the number of live oysters, measuring the shell height, and determining the, you know, that's how we determine the growth and survival, which is kind of a, the, a big thing that we want to know at all the sites. And then you can dump out sections of the reef uh, and look at all the, you know, the biodiversity there. We've used fish traps to look at habitat uplift. We've looked at the, um, done benthic grabs before and after putting a reef in a place to look at the in faunal communities in, in sediment. Um, but, and then um, we have taken water quality. We, we've looked at, we used to look at water quality more than we do now, um, to look at the, the changes in nitrogen concentration. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, 
and then we partnered with Stony Brook um, to look at the uh, like sort of gonad development and whether or not the oysters are reproducing, and then also the, the two big oyster parasites, MSX and Dermo. Well, thank you so much, Peter. I appreciate you coming by to speak with us. Um, and if you are watching at home and don't follow Billion Oyster Project on Instagram, you should, because you guys have great sea stories, I feel like, with good information, too, but very, like, engaging. So. Yeah, I agree. Thank you so much for having me. Thank really you. Fun.